Hello friends, my name is JJ. So the other day I read a very interesting and provocative article in my favorite magazine, The New Yorker. Seriously, if you ever want to learn anything about anything, a New Yorker feature story is one of the best places to go. But anyway, back in 2019, Louis Menand wrote a piece marking what he called the end of the 50th anniversary of things that happened in the 1960s a topic which he clearly found rather trite and tiresome. And during the course of making that point, he said this. One reason to feel glad to be nearly done with this round of 50ths is that we will no longer be subjected constantly to generalizations about the baby boom generation. There are many canards about that generation, but the most persistent is that the boomers were central to the social and cultural events of the 1960s. Apart from being alive, baby boomers had almost nothing to do with the 1960s. For the remainder of his essay, Menand lays out some pretty persuasive evidence that baby boomers, which is to say Americans born between 1946 and 1964, were actually mostly passive participants and consumers during the tumultuous, innovative, and often revolutionary 1960s. The decade, which as he notes, is usually imagined to be the peak years of boomer cultural influence. Even though the culture of that decade is popularly imagined to be obsessed with youth and led by young people, Menand notes that in reality, Basically all of the important artists, activists, and intellectuals of the 60s were mostly men and women who were firmly part of what we would now call the silent generation, or the generation born before the Second World War. Iconic boomer rock stars like Bob Dylan, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Jerry Garcia? None were boomers. Iconic boomer authors like Allen Ginsberg, James Baldwin, and Philip Roth? All born before the war. Directors and stars of iconic boomer movies like The Graduate and Easy Rider? No boomers here. The people leading the protests against segregation or the Vietnam War? or supporting causes like feminism or gay rights? You better believe they weren't boomers either. He concludes his piece with a firm thesis. There was a lot of youth culture in the 1960s only because there was a lot of youth. The idea that youth culture is culture created by youth is a myth. Youth culture is manufactured by people who are no longer young. When you are actually a young person, you can only consume what is out there. It often becomes your culture, but not because you made it. And the confidence with which Louis asserted this thesis about the boomers made me want to test it with other generations. So that's what we'll be talking about today. So after the boomer generation came the small but significant Generation X, who the Pew Research people define as having been born between 1965 and 1980. Most of them were in their late teens or early 20s by the 1980s, which is often held up as their equivalent to the boomers 60s in terms of when their influence on American youth culture was assumed to be peaking. And how, you ask, did that youth culture manifest? Well, one big thing is that the 1980s heralded the dawn of very teen-centric and high school-centric movies, which proved very popular for young Gen X audiences for how well their plots and actors captured what it was like to be young. Musically, the late 80s saw the rise of grunge and hip-hop as popular new genres with huge Youth Appeal, featuring lyrics and sound that supposedly captured the often weary and cynical spirit of Gen X existence. Politically, Gen X youth were famously apathetic, but they were associated with at least a few high-profile causes that began to rise during the 1980s, namely the increasingly high profile of environmental activism and pro-gay activism during the AIDS crisis. Okay, so that being the broad summary, to what degree can we say that these manifestations of 80s youth culture were actually led by Gen Xers? Well, to begin, a quick IMDb survey suggests that Gen X actors were in fact relatively common in many of the most beloved youth-centered movies of the time, though they tended to be on the older end of the spectrum, and plenty of iconic Gen X youth heroes were actually played by boomers. Matthew Broderick, for instance, who starred in the much beloved Gen X flick Ferris Bueller's Day Off, was born in 1962, making him a younger boomer. John Cusack, of boombox holding fame and say anything, was born in 1966, making him just over the Gen X line. Of the five Breakfast Club teens, three were boomers, 
and two were older Gen X. John Hughes, who directed Ferris Bueller and The Breakfast Club and often gets credit for being the Hollywood voice of Gen X youth, was born in 1950, however. Of the five main members of the pioneering rap group NWA, two were boomers, and one, Dr. Dre, was born on the transition year of 1965. All but one of the public enemy guys were boomers. On the grunge side, Kurt Cobain of Nirvana was a Gen Xer, but Chris Cornell of Soundgarden was a young boomer, as was Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam, with both of them being born in 1964. Over on the political side, the pioneering environmentalist group Greenpeace was founded in 1970 by three people, Philip Coates, Irving Stowe, and Jim Bolin, who continued to lead the group during the 1980s. They were all part of the silent generation. Not even boomers, that surprised me to learn. In 2016, the magazine Esquire published a list of the 15 most impactful people in the history of AIDS activism during the 1980s. Every single person was either a boomer or a silent, except for Ryan White, who was technically a Gen Xer, but also did his activism as a child. All right, now after Gen X comes my generation, the Millennials, the generation that is currently the most aggressive in demanding that everyone care about our nostalgia. Pew says we were born somewhere between 1981 and 1996. Peak millennial youth culture is usually said to have spanned the mid-1990s to the mid-2000s, and in many ways built on the conventions established by Gen X. We had plenty of teen-centric films too, as well as a vast number of teen-centric TV shows about high school-aged people getting up to all sorts of relatable misadventures. Musically, I feel our youth culture is associated with the golden age of so-called boy bands and girl groups featuring quite young singers, as well as increasingly young musicians more broadly. We are also considered the first generation to have a high degree of internet literacy, with a lot of early social media being portrayed as a technology that emerged in the early 2000s, by and for people under 30. Like the Gen Xers, we were considered to have been relatively politically apathetic during our youth, though our peak decade did overlap with some relatively aggressive anti-capitalist activism at times. Okay, so let's now do the age audit of the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, perhaps the two most iconic boy bands of the late 1990s, only one member qualifies as a millennial, Justin Timberlake, who was born right on the cutoff date of 1981. Of the six combined members of TLC and Destiny's Child, there is only one millennial, Beyonce, who is also a 1981 baby. Britney Spears was born in 1981 as well, while Christina Aguilera is just barely not a millennial since her birthday is in December of 1980. Eminem, however, is a pretty solid Gen Xer, born in 1972. Teen movies and TV shows of the late 90s and early 2000s continued the practice of hiring actors who were often quite a bit older than the characters they portrayed. As one of my Twitter followers noted when I posted about this the other day, none of the sexy teens in Dawson's Creek, Cruel Intentions, or American Pie were technically millennials. Neither were the male leads in the OC, show I liked quite a lot when I was young, though the female leads were. Michael Cera is a millennial, however, born in 1988. So is Anne Hathaway, born in 1982. Lena Dunham, who was born in 1986 and created the popular millennial drama Girls, is rare in being a millennial director who made a show about millennial-aged people. Most directors of teen or young adult-centric media of this era tended to be Gen Xers or Boomers. The director of Superbad, Greg Matola, for instance, was born in 1964. It's a similarly mixed bag when we look at how much influence millennials had over the early internet. Mark Zuckerberg is a millennial, born the same year as me, in fact. The two founders of Reddit are both millennials as well, but Twitter founder Jack Dorsey is a Gen Xer, as are the three founders of YouTube. Now, when I was in college, I remember that the two great Bibles of the 
anti-consumerist millennial left were No Logo by Naomi Klein, who was born in 1970, and Adbusters Magazine, which was founded in 1989 by two silent generation guys. The Adbusters people would go on to help instigate the Occupy Wall Street movement of the late 2000s, which also featured a lot more non-millennials than people often remember. According to a 2012 poll of people at New York's Ducati Park, which was the home base of the protest, 49% of the protesters were millennials, while 38% were Gen X. A 2011 article in The Atlantic identifying five budding stars of Occupy Wall Street who played a leading role in the movement named two millennials and three Gen Xers. Okay, and lastly, let us just do a quick overview of the youth culture of the Zoomers, the kids born after 1996, and the generation that we could say much of our present day youth culture revolves around. Although, if we use the previous three generations as our standard, Zoomers are likely starting to enter their decline as America's dominant youth demographic at the moment, given that the oldest Zoomers are now getting close to 30. By and large, the trends of the previous two generations have continued when it comes to TV and movies. Zach and Cody are both millennials, for instance, as are iCarly, Zoe 101, and Frankie off the chisel. Okay, I made that last one up, but give me a break. I'm old. These young people show just sound like complete nonsense to me. It does seem, however, that musicians are trending younger. Billie Eilish was born in 2001, making her pretty close to the base age of her young audience. Lil Nas X is a similar story, born in 1999. Olivia Rodrigo, meanwhile, is only 20 years old, making her one of the youngest mega successful pop stars in history. Ed Sheeran is a pretty solid millennial, however, while Post Malone is right on the brink. Zoomer youth culture is also notable for being the first youth culture to rally around celebrities who primarily exist online in the form of streamers and YouTubers and most recently TikTokers. A lot of these people really exemplify the impenetrability of Zoomer culture to the older set, but how many of them are really Zoomers themselves? Well, Logan Paul, perhaps the most infamous Zoomer superstar, is one year too old to be a Zoomer. Born in 1995, the streaming pioneer Ninja is four years older than him, and PewDiePie is two years older than Ninja. Mr. Beast is very much a Zoomer, however, born in 1998. You know who is a lot older than I expected, however? Notch, the guy behind Minecraft. He is technically a young Gen Xer, born in 1979. Although the guy that made the Zoomer classic Five Nights at Freddy's is even older than that. Born in 1978, the same year as Link Neal from Good Mythical Morning. So, in conclusion, based on this admittedly very cursory and superficial glance at the last 50 years of American youth culture, is Louis Manan's thesis true? Well, it definitely feels like it is more true than not. The idea that youth culture is something that youths primarily consume rather than make seems to be relatively consistent across the generations, and seems to hold true regardless of what realm of culture we are talking about, be it movies or tech or politics or whatever else. Now, Louis doesn't get into this in his original piece, but there are, of course, some obvious explanations for why things might be this way, why the youngs wouldn't be that active in the making of their own culture. For one thing, making things like movies or music or books requires not just passion, but connections and highly specific knowledge about things like the recording industry or Hollywood that someone in their early 20s is just very unlikely to possess at that stage of life. Even being a skilled political agitator, which we often think is requiring little more than passion for a cause, does require some degree of organizational skill and experience that people just don't tend to acquire until they're in their 30s or so. In young people's defense, it is also true that a lot of people in their 20s are likely to be college students without jobs, and thus people without a lot of the money or time that is necessary to undertake big, ambitious projects. I do think it is interesting, however, that as the internet makes it easier to create and self-publish content without a lot of intimidating upfront costs or gatekeepers, we do now seem to be witnessing a rise in some very young cultural figures to a degree that feels historically unprecedented. This brings unique challenges of its own, however, and I feel like one of the emerging social issues of our time, as the generation below the Zoomers begins to come of age, 
is what it will mean for American culture when for the first time a substantial amount of the content that young people consume is actually made by them. Historically, having older people make youth culture has almost certainly had a bit of a moderating effect on it. And I think we are now just starting to see the beginning of what sort of consequences will ensue once that moderating force begins to disappear. But anyway, I want to hear what you guys think about this whole thesis. Can you think of any good examples that either prove or disprove it? Let me know in the comments and I will see you next week.